So with the sounding of the last note of the old octave and carrying the impetus to the new octave, I'd like you all to welcome Marilyn, and her title is Science, Poet and Mystic, but the strap line is so important, Complementary Ways of Knowing and Being. Welcome, Marilyn Monk. Thank you, Peter. Good morning, everybody. So, scientist, poet, and mystic. The Scientific and Medical Network, I've been a member 30, about 35 years or something, a very long time. And I originally joined because I realized that it encompassed all of me science and all science, cosmology, ecology, biology, uh, any science we cover, and medicine and the arts, and also this other side of me. So when I uh, joined uh, the SMN, these parts of me, my scientist, my poet, and my mystic, were rather splintered in all sorts of trouble by taking themselves into the wrong place. Um, uh, as I said the other night, you know, when I be followed, started following a guru in the 70s and we all had to drop our conditioning and wear orange robes and change our name, wear 108 bead marla and so on. And that was all about reminding us all the time to drop all our conditioning and who we were and to be authentic human beings in the here and now. So, but actually going into University College London in my robes and telling everybody that I wasn't Marilyn anymore, it didn't go down too well. And, you know, it's sort of like whether you take your scientist in a love affair and start analysing things, or you take, and again, taking your speculative, imaginative, um, gut-feeling poet into the lab. That doesn't work either. We need to be appropriate as to know where we're coming from and what we're doing. But I was attracted to the SMN because it covered all everything, all these bits of me. Um, and what we're about is networking under this really wide umbrella with openness, rigor, and respect. And to be honest, I don't know of any other organization that's such a wide umbrella, and that's so, so wonderful about the SMN. Um, but often, outside, where these realms are pitted against each other, science versus religion, science versus spirituality, science versus the arts, the old arguments between C.P. Snow and Levis in the 60s in Cambridge, where uh, there was all this anxiety about the explosion in technology and science was pushing the humanities out of education, and um, there was sort of a row about it, rather than trying to work out how to bring humanities and science. And this is still a hotly debated uh, topic. So, but in, we even hear anti science uh, remarks within the SMN. You know, these words the reductionist, materialistic, mechanistic, skeptic. I always sort of cringe when these words come up. And we sometimes have some uh, uh, criticism of our spirituality that it's a bit vague or we don't quite know, you know, what we mean by spirituality. We probably all mean something different. What do we, do we believe in God or higher power or, you know, this becomes rather difficult for the scientist to cope with as science is maybe difficult sometimes for the mystic. But our title today and yesterday is A Quest for Unity and Integration, How Are We Reconciling? And I'm going to say... You know, I don't agree with these questions, and I'm going to look at what the problem is, is there a problem, and at a sort of experiential, who we are and how we're living our lives in these different realms of knowing and being. So the realms of knowing and being, I don't know anybody else who does this, and you can disagree with me, and some people do disagree with me, about dividing, um, dividing my knowing and being into these three realms, and that's fine. <laughs> but I see them, I have to see them, I have to do this. Um, I see the scientist as objective truth. When we're in our scientist, and I don't mean you're working in a lab or anything, when you're in your scientist realm, you're interested in pros and cons, rational, logical arguments, what's the evidence, what's the facts, and reproducible by anyone, anywhere, is terribly important about science. It makes your world work. Your material world works because of reproducible by anyone, anywhere. So anybody can turn on a light switch and the light comes on. Anybody can use a washing machine, a car, and everything, everything in your, the chairs you're sitting in, everything in your material world depends on reproducible by anyone, anywhere. The poet is subjective truth. This is experiential. I mean, 
what might be true for me doesn't need to be true for you for it still to be true for me. I see dead people. Not everybody sees dead people, but it's absolutely true for me. It's experiential. It's the stuff of your imagination, your dreams of beauty, love, emotions, intuition, hunch, gut feelings. Totally different from objective truth. Can you see that it's a totally different way of being? And then your mystic is transcendental truth. This is the bigger picture, the universal laws, the macrocosm, the microcosm, the interconnectedness. Everything is interconnected with everything else at all level. In every cell of your body, all the biochemical processes are interconnected. Um, everything is, and in that way, the interconnectedness means everything really knows what everything else is doing. It's the in-between of things which knows, which is the ground, all-knowing ground of being. And this is a totally different way of knowing and being. In fact, we could say, well, I'm going to say, it is absolutely obvious to me, that the scientist's realm of knowing and being is a complementary opposite realm of knowing and being. The scientist to the mystic. The scientist, it's concentration, it's effort, it's discipline. And the mystic is, well, it's just dropping your ego, dissolving your boundaries and disappearing into the ocean where we began four billion years ago or into the cosmos where we began uh, 400, 14, million, 14 billion years ago. Can you see they're total opposites? The idea of integrating them, I think, you know, is just, for me, not possible. Complementary opposites need each other. They're like you can't have up without down, you can't have light without dark, night without day, life without death. The complementary opposites are like two wings of existence. They actually need each other, um, but they're opposites. So I'm going to ask for this, for my talk anyway, and as I say, you don't have to agree with me. I'll be interested in what you have to say. If I, I might not leave you any room for discussion so that you can't disagree. So this strap, these lines, what we're doing here, I'm saying don't quest for unity, don't quest for integration. They're, and what about reconciled? Reconciled means there's two people, they have slightly different views of something and they come to some place where they can feel harmony and togetherness. So if you can accept that, um, if you can accept, accept that uh, paradox, if you can accept that opposites exist and rely on each other in order to exist, then they're already reconciled. Now, so, so I've already defined as the scientist as your reproducible anyway is, is, the, is, is the basic definition of mainstream science. It has to be. I mean, you don't want a surgeon chopping you up who's never done it before and has a hunch about how it should be done or, <laughs> or perhaps, you know. I mean, you want to get in your car and know it's going to work. Um, it's your outer material world. And we should be so grateful for science because we're so lucky. I mean, we wouldn't exist without it. We wouldn't exist without our outer material world being looked after by science. And our poet is your experiential inner realm. Um, beautiful. And your mystic is your transcendent, cosmic, all-knowing ground of being. Interconnectedness, as I, I feel, is the all-knowingness in the whole. As I always know that the in-between of things is more important than the things. And, there, and there's so much that's so important to us that's an in-between of things, like love. I mean, where is it? Is it in that person or that person? It's a sort of in-between thing. Now, if there's conflict without, which I've already mentioned, I'm going to ask you to look within to see if there's conflict within between these three realms. Um, so are you mainly scientist, poet or mystic in your approach to life? Or are you equally divided by all three? And you'll be aware, you'll be aware of conflict. Your scientist might want to sell the house or change the job, they'll weigh up the pros and cons, they'll do all the sums, the finances, and they'll consider this and this and how they're going to get their removals. And you get all ready to go, and then your poet's going to come and say, oh, but when you're so far away from Charlie and I love him, what about all these things? And, and there'll be conflict. Your heart say, no, I don't want to do this. And your son says, well, it makes sense. Um, so you'll be aware of conflict within yourself. So we're looking for that. So if you're asking yourself, are you mainly science, poet, or mystic, where do you spend most time? Which realm of knowing and being do you spend time? Um, and I, I, this is, I'm just going to do two slides of the talk I gave at the AGM last year. Because if you're asking, who am I, basically, 
um, then I want to always point out that you are just one version of hundreds of possible versions of you. Now, that's a very startling thing to think about, you know, because who you are, forget about your genes. I mean, your genes matter, but it's how they're programmed that matters. Your genes, your hardware, the programming, how they're functioning is what's important. So what determines who you are anyway? And it's pretty becoming more and more clear that the programming of your genes, whether they're on or off, uh, is adapting to your environment, physiological, neurological, psychological environment, a whole lot in the womb. So how your mother is experiencing her life programs the fetus for life. So if the mother's stressed, and it, um, then it's possible that the, the, all those chemicals of stress, cortisol, etc., are bathing the fetus in the womb, and it can turn off the glucocoid receptor gene in the hippocampus, which will mean that that child's going to grow up to be a stressed individual. I mean, it's whether the mother's her diet, her degree of well-being, ill-being, rest, uh, etc., that will all program the baby, the fetus. In early childhood, the child's born into environment. <coughs> More programming has to happen. The child has to be adapted to the environment. If the environment is tough, the child's genes are programmed to be tough. So that if there's abuse, abandonment, neglect, the kid learns to be a little tough bully. And if there's nurturing and love, the child learns to relax and to be soft and gentle. There's no doubt about this. And then I didn't talk about this last time, but it's incredibly important. We take up service to our local community Everybody's everything, everything from the atom to our solar system is in service to a higher order structure. And in us, service, we need to be in service. It activates the pleasure centers in the brain. We like to serve. And so we go into a role in our communities to serve. There are anarchists, but <coughs> society will only tolerates so many anarchists. And uh, we take on a role. Have you ever noticed that waiters look like waiters? Judges look like judges. Nerds look like nerds. Actresses look like actresses. Now, they weren't born like that. They molded themselves around their role to look like what they do. We're dubbed by nature to be a one version of you. Now, if you're born as... Uh, oh, this first occurred to me when somebody said, if you were born into a Mexican... If me, if I was born into a Mexican drug cartel, I wouldn't be this me. I'd be another me. If I was born into war, into famine... Um, uh, if I was brought up by Bedouins in the desert, forget about my genes, I'd be a different me. There's a fact that you just, one, I'm just saying that we can open ourselves to experiencing being different than how we're, how, what our habit is to be. And of course, once I say all this, we, we immediately say, well, could we be these other persons? change ourselves, our genes, our future? That's a very important question because now that we know that modifications are superimposed on genes in the way parents live their lives can pass through sperm and egg. That was our, one of our discoveries, actually, which I'll talk about in a minute. Lamarckian inheritance. And we could even think um, perhaps we could cha change in ways... The importance, you know, like uh, climate change and everything, of future generations, how we are, is terribly important for our children and their children. So now this is the only other slide I'm going to have about this. So before you get too enthusiastic by transforming immediately into somebody else you always wanted to be, um, there are huge barriers to change. And in, in, in academic psychology, it's called turning points, and they're really, really rare. And they require absolute 24-7 removal of the child or adolescent into a completely different environment. So there's nobody that knows you. I mean, I had to reinvent myself several times. Once when I was removed from the temperate forests in the, in the bush in Australia and put in a college where all the other girls were, were a lot more cultured than I was. I had to reinvent myself. And, of course, coming from Australia and leaving behind my barbecues and my horse and the surf and everything and being incredibly ignorant culturally, coming to England at 21 without anybody knowing me again, I suddenly thought, oh, and, 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 and sort of feels really artificial, but you have to, you probably all have had some, some change somewhere in your life where you've had to reinvent yourself. So the barriers to change, habit. Now, habit's wonderful because when you get stimulus, 
Response is locked to stimulus, boom, that's habit. It's actually wired in networks of neurons in your brain. And you, react, you, you respond very, very quickly. So habit's very good because it makes you very fast. But um, you will always respond the same way. So if as a kid you picked up a pen and you gripped it and did your jaw and hunched and so on, you likely to do that all the life, your whole life, the way you did it the first time, the second time, the third time. Um, so a stimulus response habit determines how you are. And then, of course, habit creates faulty sensory perception. Habit is familiar. So that if you always picked up the pen like that, if somebody said, now, come on, you know, straight, you know, just gently now and look after yourself, it would feel peculiar. Or if your parents slumped when they sat in chairs, you slump when you sit in a chair. When you sit in a chair, you slump. And if somebody comes and gets you to use the chair properly, it'll feel peculiar. So we have faulty sensory perception, which keeps us locked in, in, in faulty habits. And then people who know you expect to say the same. So if you try to be somebody different, everybody's going to say, you know, who do you think you are? What are you, what are you up to? And then, as I said, the adaptation to serve in the environment, it's quite difficult once you're settled into your role and you're dressed and behaving according to that role and that's who you are. It's quite difficult to change. Change happens, turning points happen often when boys who've been really uh, tough and bullying and... Uh, but expelled from school and so when they go into the army for a few years and they wear uniforms they stand up straight and they march and step very good for pleasure centers and um, learn some pride in themselves change um, uh, and also you know a boy might meet a girl in a pub and gravitate to her peer group and family that will bring about change or like me like leaving my uh, bush environment and going into this cultured women's college when I was only 16 or leaving the country at 21. Now, obviously, I'm going to also talk again a little bit about Alexander Technique because it's terribly important when we consider these things that there is a route to self-mastery and I call it Alexander Technique. So I'm to I've, to I've put these two slides in because I'm asking you what about doing some experiments in the three realms of knowing and being, at least. You, know, you can't expect to change today from being a person who does science. See, once you know that I'm... I tend to say I'm a scientist. I have been a scientist, academic, bent scientist for 55 years. I am a scientist, but I'm not. I'm a person doing science. Um, so we can think what experiments we're doing. And I, I'm just going to talk about my experiments because that's all I know about. Um, so my experiments, science, I've always was a scientific child. I was always, I didn't like other kids very much. I think that probably scientists are born a little bit autistic. Um, <laughs> but, but if you think about the definition of autism today, it means socially dysfunctional. Whereas me, I mean, I see, I see society as dysfunctional. You know? <laughs> Not me, but everything around me. And so I think that's a better definition of autism. Um, you're looking in for the outside and you think, are they mad or what? You know, um, I really feel that all the time. Are they mad? You know, what's going on? Um, so I was always a scientist fiddling around with tarantulas and um, spiders and diverting ant trails into tunnels and herding the chooks and all of that stuff as a child. And then I went to an ashram in India and became an orange person. I didn't mean to. It's something that happened to me. And um, then because I was interested in this self-mastery question, I trained in Alexander Technique, which was a very intensive three-hour day, three-year training, and psychosynthesis. And I've always um, been an artist, always drawing things, especially horses. Um, so to start with the infamous Rajneesh. Um, Sri Rajneesh uh, was a professor of philosophy in uh, India and, and travelling around giving lectures in his very simply dressed in white robes and he attracted huge numbers of Westerners um, who gathered around him I mean I would say he didn't set up his ashram but the numbers of people he attracted from the West set up his ashram and he attracted quite a lot of fairly of middle aged people who'd gone a long way in their lives in education and achievement and fulfilling their, 
desires because his position was you will not be ready to die for enlightenment if you're still hankering for a bigger car or a better job or a different, a prettier woman or something. So he did attract these people who had gained an awful lot in life and, and, and <coughs> were thinking well, it must be something else. Um, and in, I went to Pune because my brother-in-law was there and he was coming to our house in his orange robes and putting on these tapes and telling us to call him Uncle instead of George and I thought he was completely mad. And one day he, he said he was really quite upset that could I not see that I was hurting him and, and that went to my heart and I said, I'm so sorry. So I went to the centre you know, and meditated for the first time in my life and things happened immediately. I mean, it was, I mean, things sort of as if coming in from the outside were happening in my body and moving me and all sorts of stuff like that. So we did loads of meditations in Pune and I went there with my kids every year for two or three months over Christmas, took them out of school, couldn't do that today. Um, and we used to call it Club Med and we had a ball. And uh, we went there every street for three months, you know, every, every year for about five, five, five years anyway. And so it had a big influence on my life. So we did it meditations designed by Rajneesh himself. That were, were, I mean, people think they're sort of mad meditations because they sometimes have a lot of jumping about and shouting so that he can get our Western busy minds, throw everything out before you could sit quietly, that sort of thing. But we did sort of classical... Um, Buddhist and Zen meditations as well. And it attracted a whole lot of group leaders from Esalen, the west coast of America, who were influenced by Rogers and Maslow and that lot, and they were into all these groups like Encounter and Primal and Regression and, um, and sort of Gurdjieff and Auspensky stuff. And, uh, um, and these group leaders were all attracted and they came and ran all these groups there. Um, and course, <laughs> and and I say it was a meeting of East and West and a blending of techniques that heighten. And I just want to say at this point, where we're talking about science and spirituality coming together, it is a sort of meeting East and West, and the time is now becoming ripe for it. So it is happening where it wasn't really possible in the past so easily. Um, so that was my, that would, would be a big mystical experiment. And this is a scientific experiment, so that in the 80s, I trained for three years with an Alexander technique. And the reason I did that was I was very interested in the idea of self-mastery, you know, because, I mean, I think my school report, first school report said um, when I was seven, highly intelligent but no common sense. And um, <laughs> so I think, I, you know, I really did realise that I... I didn't have much common sense. And I thought, I, one of his books is called Conscious Constructive Control of the Self, and I thought, how good could that be? <laughs> and to explain to Alexander Technique, it's best explained by a few pictures. Here's a little girl. Perfect poise and balance is a birthright. And you see small children, they just move from here now to here now to here now. So one minute they might be giggling, the next minute they're crying, the next minute they're contemplating, then they're asleep, and then they're crying again. And they leave what was happening before, they leave it behind them. So they're not still patterned with all their response to stimuli. And remember, thoughts are your major stimuli, thoughts. They're not, every thought you have goes into your body. So you're not all patterned. They're just it's a little tabula rasa, nothing happening, ready for anything. That's, we, that's where we want to go to now, revert to that being a child. And when they go into action, perfect poise and balance. Here this chap is sort of negotiating some really rocky terrain. Um, but you see the perfect poise and balance, like a little angle poise lamp. The heavy weight of the skulls directed forward and up, top of the spine, which is between your ears. Hips go back, knees forward, wrist back. You know, it's not all this slumping stuff. It's perfect poise and balance when you go into activity. So we're born with that, and what happens? <laughs> what on earth happens to us? Now, this little chap, he's still got it. 
But once you have all this distorted use of self, it's associated with distorted thinking, distorted emotions. It's gone wrong. And it's made worse by education. So here's some little boys in a class learning to write. Oh, see the gripping of the pen. All these internal organs are compressed, internal organs compressed. Stress, frowning, probably jaws are involved, tension. What's wrong with our education that it lets kids sit and write like that? So Alexander Technique is a re-education. It is not a treatment. It's not a therapy. It's a re-education in best balanced poise use of self in response to stimuli. Stimuli are your daily activities, cleaning your teeth, walking down the stairs, uh, hitting a golf ball. You'll do it in the old wrong way. Um, but by far the most common stimuli are your thoughts. Every thought you have it goes into your body. So an anxious thought, uh, so an emotion, say you think, oh, that's awful, everything will go down. Or that's wonderful, everything goes up. So your thoughts are regulating your body. And what the crux of Alexander's technique is inhibition. It's all gone into academic neuroscience now, and it's called free won't. You know, we all are very busy with free will, but what is far more important is free won't. And inhibition is a pause or hiatus that we put between stimulus and response. So stimulus, sit in chair, no. And I give powerful directions from my brain, mind, let the neck be free here, because if this joint, if the heavy way the skull's pulled down on this tiny little bone top of your spine, it inactivates your whole postural reflex. Your posture going up in response to gravity is a reflex. It goes through the spine. It's not something you can do. In fact, it's what you do trying to get things right that creates the tension that inactivates the postural reflex. That is a fact. So uh, to restore the postural reflex, first this joint's got to be free. And this joint here, the trouble is, it, it tightens in sympathy. Even if you think of, of tightening a fist, something happens here and that is lost. So let, let's allow the head to go forward and up in response, uh, in relation to the top of the spine, such a way back to the back widens. Now, okay, this is purely scientific. So this is in the realm of the scientist. In fact, Alexander was very against the use of intuition to uh, uh, guide your activities. Very against intuition, very against the poet realm. This is pure science, but look how it has offshoots into the spirit. Right mindfulness, awareness, conscious, alertness, watchfulness, witnessing. And as you saw in those pictures of the children, presence, powerful presence. So it, uh, so what I'm doing is showing you how, how, how different realms of knowing and being influence the other realms. They're separate, but they influence each other. And um, so this is just a wonderful thing to remember. After four billion years since you came out of the ocean, uh, when began in the ocean, began in the ocean, you can pretty well trust, have faith, trust and hope that your body has evolved to work beautifully, your ears and your eyes and your nose and your posture, everything has evolved to work the best it could possibly be. You already have that, that's your birthright. So this is the rule, eliminate the wrong to allow the right to come through of its own accord. Trying to get things right is effort and tension and it activates your poised and balanced use of self. Then the next experiment I did was in the realm of the poet the realm of uh, knowing of being as a poet. And it was a training with a Sagioli. It's again another three-year training. Um, and Sagioli trained with Freud and then with Jung. And then he went off to the East and learned spiritual things. And um, the important thing about this training, again, and why I chose it, is that it's a very, very wide umbrella. So Sagioli deals with past, childhood issues, your inner child. It deals with the present, existential issues. I mean, do you like your job or where you live? I mean, look at it, right here now, existential issues. And future, potential, what makes your heart sick? Do you love what you're doing? 
Is there something you want to do in the future that you would absolutely love doing? So this was a training in the realm of knowing and being as a poet. And what the Sajdal is saying here, translated into English, before being able to communicate psychosynthesis to others, we must have experimented with it in depth, experimented in depth. That's what's important, you know. I remember experimenting on de in depth of going out of my body for months. For months I pretended I was dead and I couldn't move an eyelid or a muscle or a finger in order, according to Lobsam uh, Rampa or whatever his name was, that I could go out of my body. And then I did. And I never did that experiment again because I didn't really like it. But anyway, um, you must experiment in depth because knowledge is not sufficient. What if you were to study all the spiritual writers that you could think of, you know, Mara, Vera and Krishna and Jesus and Buddha and Confucius, and study everything they said, it wouldn't really mean a thing if it was just knowledge. There has to be an inner knowing for it to make a difference. So that was... And, uh, uh, Sajioli divided ways to the self. I mean, not my scientist, poet and mystic. I don't know if anybody's done a scientist, poet and mystic. And sometimes when I think about it, my triangle doesn't look quite right. It should have the mystic on top, I think. I put the scientist on top for obvious reasons. Um, or the mystic should be a big round circle and we put the poet and the scientist inside it and so on. So I don't know other people who do my triangle. But you can see there's aspects of the Sagioli's ways to the self um, that, are, that are the same. And I love a Sagioli's ways to the self of the scientist which he defined, or somebody in a psychosynthesis defined as, I want to cure you all of all this materialistic, mechanistic, reductionist, skeptic stuff. So the scientist is born, science is born of wonder and curiosity. Some people say awe and pursued with a passion. How could this miracle come about? And don't think solving miracles takes away miracles because if you, if this is the your known area, then that's your unknown. When you expand the known area, you expand the unknown. So solving mysteries is not bad or miracles. You've got to pursue science with passion, with honesty, acute observation, discipline, science, perseverance. People don't realize that when you're a scientist and you're trying to understand how something happens and you have no idea of what the answer is, no idea at all, you do failure, failure, try this failure, try this failure. I had over my desk, failures on the way to success. Or if first you don't succeed, pick yourself up and try. Because a lot of people would not persevere given all the failures you have when you're trying to work, trying to work something out. And usually the answer doesn't come from the directions you're trying in. It comes from somewhere up there and, and arises from some mistake you've made. Or I'll uh, mention a few things. It comes from somewhere else. It lands on your doorstep. And then when that happens, and of course the, the open-mindedness and the flexibility, you must look for things that don't fit. People, if you find a scientist who's trying to fit everything into his hypothesis, you're not a scientist, because you've got to look for the things that don't fit. They're the ones, the things that don't fit have got the information, the new information in them. It could be. Uh, what you call what a lot of scientists call an artifact dispensed with because it's a bad batch of primers or something but that's a mistake you pursue the things that don't fit because you've got to disprove your hypothesis and that's paradigm shift come from disproving hypothesis I've had three paradigm shifts I'll tell you about them and they didn't I didn't do them they were gifts um, and the conceptual elegance when suddenly you see how something works it's obvious, and it was never obvious before. It's a bit like Pythagoras' theorem, square of the hypotenuse, the square of the two sides. You think, when he puts that into a three-dimensional box, it's obvious, absolutely obvious. And then the wonderful Eureka feeling. <clears throat> so coming back to our scientist, poet and mystic, I've talked about my experiments in, in, with Rajneesh and... Uh, um, I won't describe my experiences, but I do have experiences in this realm that my scientist wouldn't have a clue about. My scientist tries to unravel them, you know, so that if 
somebody when they die in some other country and they come to visit me in a dream. This happens to me so often. It's really, really weird. And it's not a coincidence because then I might email them or write a letter and I only find out later that that's when they died. And I try to think, well, in the realm of interconnectedness, the, you know, the energetic... Uh, versions of me since birth are going out in the speed of light <coughs> and sound and all other energies that we know and don't know. So I'm out there, all my energies are out there, an imprint of who I was from the beginning are out there. From the beginning, scrambled, you would think, because they're going off at the speed that they'd go off at and out there. But what about entanglement? And what about if images, all those energies of me, are entangled and can be recovered in formation? as information. And perhaps those people I was really close to in my life, their stuff's entangled with mine. Anyway, that's what my scientists trying to work out, but it's, I realise it's quite mad. Um, so, thinking about where we're we going next. Poet. Let's think about... I went to the poet with a sagioli, but let's think about art. Now, as I said, these are separate realms of knowing and being, but they influence each other and they had offshoots into each other. Don't merge, blend, integrate, average, da da. Keep them as their beautiful whole selves, but note their influence. This is uh, Western art. You see the influence of the scientist taking everything apart, dismembering. And this is the influence of the mystic in Eastern science. And here you see everything's going on. You've got animals, you've got houses, trees, rivers. Mountains, people working, people having fun. And uh, so the realms are separate, but they influence each other. My own art, which I've been involved with, uh, I've always drawn horses. I think I was born drawing horses. And I used to spend my childhood, I can remember, at the age of three, I would escape and go up to the dairy horses out the back in Australia. And they were huge, big, feathered feathered-legged uh, draft horses and I'd sit there three years old and hand them a blade of grass and they're the big blubbery lips was one of my first memories and I just adored horses uh, so there's a, these are just a few of my paintings of horses badly photographed because of the light on the glass and this is a painting I made of me on my horse um, and the paintings I love this is my dog a sketch of my dog playing with the hose water and my sons, and I love doing tapestries as well. That's it because, did you know that when you use your hands, it activates the pleasure centers of the brain? So that if you sit in front of telly, if you've got some knitting, I can't sit in front of telly without tapestry or knitting, and I'm, I, I just think, what a waste of time. But if, but if I'm stitching away at a tapestry, then I'm per perfectly happy. And I love painting in the style of the old master, especially Rembrandt. And uh, this one, um, if I were to try to, some of you might paint, draw and so on, and try to think, what's influencing my art? Is it my scientist? Is it my mystic? All I can say is that I, as a scientist, I try to do things really accurately, so that I do, if I'm drawing Marilyn Monroe, I do a mathematical, I'm measuring that distance, that distance, the size of... <clears throat> that thing. I'm not doing eyes and nose and mouth or anything. I'm looking at shapes and angles and depths of colour and so on. So very mathematical. Um, but while I'm doing it, I'm not there. There's no time. It's, it's really weird. I just go out somewhere. And then when I stop doing my mathematical reproduction, I look at something and I think, where did that come from? And then I think that's the mystic because it doesn't... Something has come into this picture that wasn't there, that must have come from somewhere else. Now, I bet, now I want to, if you don't mind, talk about science, which is not something I've done before, because if I attempt to talk about, you know, bench science, I understand that it's quite, it, it is quite difficult to understand. Um, but I'm going to try because I want to, sort of my reasoning. So, my path through science has been very varied. I started in 1959 working in a lab in Australia in molecular genetics because in the 50s the structure of DNA was found and so everybody was doing molecular genetics in a bacterium. Then I got bored with that and moved to developmental biology because I just love this organism 
I got bored because in a way doing molecular biology, well at that stage when I was young, uh, it was sort of moving things from tube to tube, water bath to water bath, in and out the centrifuge and so on. And it was mechanical for me. I didn't like it much. And I wanted to uh, have work with something that, that did something interesting that I could watch. So I moved uh, So I moved to um, this one. And then through no choice of my own, I was sat. I was launched into the mouse embryo, and that immediately took me into um, a clinical science and uh, developing these are we did all the pioneering experiments uh, diagnosing early di- genetic disease in a single cell of an IVF embryo, created human embryo libraries so that people could do unlimited analysis without needing another embryo, and isolated embryo cancer genes. So those are the clinical things which I'll talk about. Now I want to say at the outset that scientists are reductionists, but they know about interconnectedness. They absolutely know about interconnectedness. Because in the, when I started science in the 50s, we all, it was biochemistry then, and we all knew that there were approximately 3,000 biochemical pathways interconnected in every cell. All those pathways, what a nightmare. They're interconnected, and if you change any pathway, you increase a product or destroy a substrate or increase or, or take away some cofactors or elements or something. If you interrupt a pathway, you shift the whole thing to some other place. It's called metabolic flux. So it's like a suspension structure, and you shift that one over there, and everything has to go with it. And you might experience that. So you could say, this creates what we call the metabolome, responding to the environment all the time. Uh, Everything's got an ohm on it now. But you don't have to worry, because in studying it, mathematically we know there are certain key players, like government whips. So you might think of everybody in government being interconnected and all talking to each other, but there are certain people like the leaders and the whips who are key players. So if you know what they're doing, you have a better idea what everybody else is doing. And that's also true of these biochemical pathways. Now, so scientists have pity on them, um, know about interconnectedness, but have to be a reductionist. Say you want to know what this pathway here does. Okay, so you make a mutation in the gene for that enzyme, you knock out that enzyme or you remove its cofactors or something, and you look at what happens to the phenotype of the cell or the organism and what happens to the whole thing. But if you were to knock out that one and that one and that one and that one all at the same time, you wouldn't learn a thing. So it's called, so a lot of science, mechanical science, so you want to know what the wheels do in a car, Mechanical science removes one wheel, the car won't roll. Ah, the wheels are there to roll the car. It's, it's having one variable to see what that particular part does, even though the scientist knows that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So you'll have to excuse reduction of science. But I have to say, right now, with high throughput techniques, we can look at every gene in the cell, whole genome sequencing. We can look at the expression of every gene in a cell. We can look at the methylation modification of every single gene in a cell. So now we can look at everything all at once. So science is going to change quite a lot to being um, more um, connectedness driven. Um, but although it started with biochemistry, these two chaps, with the help of Rosalind Franklin, discovered the structure of DNA. And that was a huge huge turnaround event because it was the birth of the central dogma and the central dogma says DNA is king, genes are it. So the central dogma is simply that the DNA makes the RNA, makes the protein and therefore we don't know anything, need to know anything else except the DNA and the Human Genome Project to sequence all the genes is the answer to everything and that was wrong. Some of us, I knew that was wrong. I mean, when Peter says that, I mean, I did the first experiments to show epigenetic regulation and gene expression, but the term epigenetics was coined by Waddington in Edinburgh in the 50s because he knew that all cells have the same genes, but different cells do different things. Some cells do nerve or skin or gut or do. So obviously there have to be different subpopulations of the genes active. And there had to be a mechanism to do that. So what I discovered was the mechanisms. So, so the Human Genome Project caused uh, everybody 
to work with DNA. Now, not to decry the importance of DNA as the molecule of inheritance, because once we knew about the double helical structure, we knew how it replicated the new strand. The new strand here copied the sequence of the bases, adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine on the old strand. So when these two strands segregated, the, the whole rule of inheritance is that like begets like, like begets like. So we knew how it all happened. And a mistake or error or radiation-induced break would cause a mutation. And then in the 1960, the code was worked out. So these four bases are read as triplets, C-A-T, G-T-G, A-G-C. And each triplet corresponds to an amino acid in a protein that a length of that gene codes for. So biochemistry became molecular biology, and I was immediately a part of that. They did ask if I wanted to work on blowflies causing damage to merino sheep, but I decided I'd work with sex in bacteria instead. So these are two bacteria having sex, which is not terribly interesting. This is the male, and it's got an extra piece of DNA that causes it to make these pili that connects it to the female. Then it replicates its DNA and puts its genes into the female. So all that sex means is a method of transmitting genes amongst individuals of a population. So that's what the bacteria were doing as well. And we could identify different mutants and map them. And one of the wonderful things at this time was to find that the bacterial chromosome was circular. But as I said, I became really bored with bacteria because this was a, that's, all they could do is sort of elongate, divide, and have sex like this. And I thought that was really boring. And so I decided to move to these slime mold amoebae because they talk to each other. Um, I hear they're saying, hi, my name's something. Who, uh, anyway, they communicate with each other. So I left molecular biology behind to say, how are they communicate? How do they do that? And also the other really fascinating thing about them is that they have two life cells. They can, sit, they can be single amoebae crawling around eating, am I okay? Yeah, fine. E eating bugs. Ten minutes, that'll be all right. I'll just speed up. Uh, or not. Um, <laughs> and they have two lifestyles. I mean, this is amazing. They can be individuals. Imagine you could do this. Or they could join up and become a multicellular organism and do something else as that. So I decided to work on that. And what was really lovely, I had something to look at now. So these chaps are saying, uh, look out, look out, here comes the microscope slide. And then they're all squashed. <laughs> or else, what they're doing down there is saying, the eye, the eye. <laughs> but I mean, this taught me, this is something I really wanted, was that connection with the material. Because I wasn't connected with the bacteria. I didn't care about them. And I cared about these chaps. So I, when I looked at my amoeba, I was like, you're all right. Or what are you doing? Or what are you doing over there? And, uh, you know, is that connection that the scientist has. Now, I mean, scientists, I mean, some might be detached mechanical, materialistic, mechanistic skeptics, and only that. I mean, you're not supposed to have this connection. You're not supposed to bring your emotions, compassion, and empathy in. But, um, but if you do, it's a whole added, I think, insights come from, like, for instance, uh, I, I could even connect with my DNA in the tube, and I think, I want to look at you, but you're all in a terrible tangle. Um, oh, not that I can see that. It's just that I can feel it. And uh, what I'm going to do is cut you into bite-sized pieces, and that'll help. And that was a breakthrough technique to make single cell. That thought, you're all in a tangle, poor thing. Um, that thought created single cell um, molecular DNA work. Um, so this is dictyostelium. They're beautiful miraculous amoebae. They're very crowded here. They're all, I was only in the field for a couple of years because I got a sack in 74. Um, they, they, um, they're, they're busy feeding on uh, uh, rotting vegetation in the wild and they gobble up, they move around and gobble up um, bacteria. But when they run out of food, look what happens. Now, the breakthrough in this work was being, my being able to get these rings reproducibly because nobody could. You maybe would be feeding and, well, I'll show you in a minute what they did without telling you how they were doing it. 
But I used to take these plates home and watch them during the night, get up on the dining room table in Edinburgh. Oh, and, I, and I was watching them all day. Said, all you have to do is remove the food, and they do this. Um, and watching them all day, and hours, and I used to throw the plates out because suddenly they'd gone to another stage of development, and I didn't see how they did it. And one night um, in Edinburgh, I got really tired, and I threw the plates into our fridge. And we have a fridge that was a really old fridge in the kitchen. It was at eight degrees. And somehow, it che- the lower temperature from 25 degrees, which they like normally, changed the way they moved or behaved with the signalling so that I've got these reproducible rings. So the paper in the materials and methods says incubate your plates at 8 degrees. And everybody does that. But I, I mean, I couldn't write in the paper because I had this old fridge and that's why I'm about that. <laughs> but what happens is that when they run out of food, what they're doing here is aggregating. When they run out of food, they start emitting a pulse of a chemical, cyclic AMP. And the chemical diffuses out through the medium and those of me be that are within above threshold range, they can see the gradient where the chemicals come from and they make a movement step towards the source and then they emit the chemical as well and then they go into a refractory period because they're surrounded by their own chemical. So it goes out. So what you get is a relaying out of signalling and bands of material, uh, maybe, sorry, moving in. And then they form these wonderful spirals And then they start being attracted to each other on the way to the center. They start, and they organize into spirals and streams, like this wonderful galaxy. I mean, absolutely beautiful creatures. And they pile up in the center here, and then uh, they form a slug. This pile falls over, and they form this multicellular slug. I mean, it's totally miraculous. And the reason they do this is amoebae can only go through little micrometer distances eating, gobbling the bugs. Whereas when they run out of food, they've got to get to the soil surface. So they've got this bigger chap, which lots of them cooperating together, and that can move through centimetres. And the tip is phototactic, attracted to the light, and thermotactic, attracted to the heat. So this sluggy slug slimes its way towards the soil surface where there's light and heat. And when it gets there, it makes this mound and then a third of the cells sacrifice their lives um, to uh, continue the species. They sacrifice their lives to form this stalk and the other two thirds in here form these spores and then a passing ant or your hiking boot or something transfers them to another feeding ground where hopefully there'll be more bugs for them to eat. Now because I could reproducibly get these rings together with a student of mine. I could analyse, I could look at them in the microscope. What are they doing in the light ring and the dark ring and do time-lapse films? And I could work out all the parameters of aggregation with a student of mine, Fernanda, that was way back in 1974. And we could work out um, the cyclic signalling periodicity, velocity it travelled out, how long the cells were refractory after they emitted their own signal, how, far, how long they moved for, the distance they moved over. We get all these parameters and published that in 74. And uh, I went to a slime mould meeting last week after, 70, after 43 years of not having worked with them and I was really happy that a lot of people remembered this. They called it iconic. <laughs> iconic. Um, but then, oh, horror, horror. Um, The Medical Research Council used to make and break units around uh, very clever people and uh, they closed our unit. And and basically it meant that you were just out on your own and uh, science was over unless you could find somewhere else to work. Well, um, being a female, which is always difficult, and working with slime molds, which weren't going to cure cancer at that time, um, I couldn't really get, find anybody that really wanted to... I mean, they said things, well, what would you know about retinal tectal projections or what would you know about development of a chick wing? Because I, I didn't know anything but molecular biology and cell communication. So, But this lady, the Right Honourable Lady Anne McLaren, who was an absolutely amazing, amazing person, who I was fortunate to work with for 18 years as a role model and surrogate mother. She couldn't be better. 
although she wouldn't like to be called surrogate mother. And then she also uh, became a dame of the British Empire and was Foreign Secretary at the Royal Society on the Warnock Committee and Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority and a really powerful woman. And also, but she worked mammalian development, but it happened, and this is serendipity, I was being sacked from Edinburgh and just happened she was going from Edinburgh to London to set up a new unit and people saying, why don't you phone Anne? And so I did. She said, of course you must. You must come to me, you must. And I thought, is she mad? You know. Um, but as I say, she was well known for supporting women scientists because always little, I always put in these little slides how difficult it is to be a woman. That's an excellent suggestion, Miss Triggs. Perhaps one of the men would like to make it my experience of, <laughs> of board meetings. Anyway, it doesn't matter. If you've if been a female all your life, you sort of get a bit used to it. Um, but she worked with these very early stages of mouse development. The fertilized egg goes to two cells, four cells, eight cells, clump of cells. The first differentiation, these outer cells are going to make the placenta, the inner ones, are the pluripotent embryo stem cells, and then these cells are going to make the yolk cell. And then it implants in the uterus, and these are very early stages before formation of a fetus, immediately post-implantation. So she worked with these stages. So immediately, I thought, oh, my God, I hadn't thought. Of, I, th I thought, oh, thank you, Anne, thank you very much, I will. And then I thought a bit more, and I thought molecular biology requires millions of cells. Embryos are one cell, two cell, four cell, and I can't kill a mouse. I mean, I pick up stray worms, I couldn't possibly kill a mouse. Uh, so Anne said, well, never mind, why don't we start off by you working on the molecular techniques to make them a million times more sensitive? So I did. And this just required a whole lot of technical uh, invention. And in those days in the labs, we used to have a workshop with a man who used to make your equipment for you because nowadays equipment is all provided by commercial form, firms for huge amounts of money. But there was a time in science when we used to have to invent our equipment as well as design our experiments and so on. So we used these little tiny two, two microliter gels and sort of suspended them in a little funnel and the thing and devised a battery <coughs> to make electric current and separated some enzymes. And here, by mistake... I put, hello, I put neat radioactive label in these reactions. <clears throat> very hot tritium and very hot 14C by mistake. And suddenly had single cell analysis of using that sort of technique of many genes. It's in the 70s that was. And then in early 80s, <clears throat> somebody in America discovered how to use primers matching say, 100 base pairs of DNA in the full 10 to the 9 base pairs in the nucleus and amplify up just that 100 so you could look at them, see what was happening to it. And we did sort of nested PCR approaches. Oh, you angel, thank you. We did nested PCR approaches to the single cell and that was a real breakthrough discovery. A lot of people couldn't do it because they got too much contamination because the more sensitivity your technique, the higher the sensitivity, the more likely it's going to get contaminated. But we could, I could do it because I was trained in bacteriology in the university, so I knew all about sterile techniques. And then, just I'll put this here because I'm showing it here, that technique and that technique, were immediately soon went into clinical application of the pioneering experiments establishing what's called pre-implantation genetic disease. This is diagnosing in a mouse model for Leshnayan, taking one cell from an embryo. And th those one cells there are the embryos that are mutant. And this is a thalassemia mouse lacking beta globin. And these embryos without a product in one cell uh, are the ones with thalassemia. And this is a human egg, actually. And that's a little throwaway cell called polar body. It's the unequal division, the last unequal division to make a big egg. And taking just that polar body, we could diagnose which eggs would give rise to babies with sickle cell disease. And that was very influential in getting a bill through Parliament in uh, 1990. So, don't worry about this, this is too much. But uh, basically, you could look at proteins. You can see when they came on, where they came on. Look at dosage. 
I mean, females have got two X chromosomes, males only got one. At some point, the females got to inactivate one of those Xs. Did a lot with that. So you could look at all the genes on the X and see no one, two, two were expressed and one was expressed. We could have a mutant gene and we could look at the gene in the egg and the sperm and do them different. This is the origin of imprinting, which was, again, a paradigm shift from our work. And then from the measurement of DNA, we could look at mutation in a single cell for disease diagnosis. We could see if a single cell was making, was on or off. And then we could look at why it was one or off. What were the mechanisms that turned a gene on and off? And that was the beginning of epigenetics. And of course, we made resources. So there was no need for more embryos and you could do a whole lot of work in those resources. So this is the first paradigm shift. This is development of a mouse embryo. And I'm looking at genes on the X. So they're on while they're dividing. They're on in the cells inside the blastocyst, but the paternal X goes off in the tissue that's going to make the placenta. And then they're both on in these fetal precursor cells. And then the paternal X goes off in the cells that are going to make the yolk sac. And then there's random inactivation. And then there was a doctrine that pervaded all of development called the continuity of the germline. It's called the Weissman Doctrine. And it meant that if you're going to have germ cells making your next generation, they'd have to come off really early before there are any restrictions in potency. And shock horror, we found that these germ cells out here immediately post-implantation all had one of the X's off. And then we did other experiments to actually show that they were derived quite late in development. Now, the Weissman Doctrine... Was, came from studies with sea urchins, frogs and flies and things which were the models for development and they had a bit of germplasm went into germ cells but in mammals the embryo is kept inside the mother um, it's quite different from laying eggs in the wild and so as soon as we found this I mean nobody believed this for 10 years would you believe even though our experiments were really good they just didn't want to know um, so this was our first paradigm shift in mammals, the late origin of the germ cells, because they've got one whole X off. They can't be totipotent. And then as soon as they're not totipotent, the next thought that comes into your head, there has to be a way of bringing them back to totipotency. A bit more of that's going to be something about epigenetics. And so, still heavily influenced by my slime moulds, I had to make this Catherine wheel um, model that my slime moulds used to aggregate. And, and so we worked out a whole load of insights into development just by looking when genes the paternal X comes on it goes off it's on one or other goes off it's off in the germline it's on again so immediately and I've already we did experiments which I won't haven't got time to tell you about showing that the germline came off here quite late not there Um, and that was the first paradigm shift so the immediate question now that I would ask What's turning the genes on or off? And now we get to epigenetics. This is the modification superimposed upon the gene DNA to regulate gene activity. So thinking, this is a slide I drew in the early 80s, thinking how would I, if I were a piece of DNA, how would I turn a bit of me off? So these are on, these are off. I could make myself in a huge tangle. That would put a spanner in the works. I could wind myself around some proteins I didn't like. I could actually chemically modify a base in the DNA. Or I could hold it open with a transcription apparatus. Or I could pack it away. So I was just thinking, how would I do it? And uh, thinking how I did it, I already knew about um, chemical modification of DNA bases from bacteria because they use chemical modif- they use recognition of that to keep foreign viruses out. So it's a form of immunity in bacteria. So if you put a methyl group on the cytosines in a stretch of DNA, that gene's off and that one's on. So we actually showed that, that that's how it worked in 1984 in a different system. I'm not going to talk about that. So we did the first experiments demonstrating methylation modification of gene activity. So what about my developing system? Okay, remember here the XP's got to come on, so it's got to deprogram. Here it's going off, so... It's being methylated, um, and, all the, and it goes off in the cells that are going to make the germline, but then they have to drop all their methylation to come back to totipotency. So this is what we showed. This is the diagram of what we showed. Again, it was very shocking for everybody in the field 
discovery of deprogramming and reprogramming, wiping out the methylation modification of the genes and putting it back on again. Um, but, and it, it wasn't believed for five years, believe it or not. Um, and then, the icing on the cake, what is the difference between the extra and the sperm pattern or the extra and the egg that makes them choose this one to turn off way out there and here we did single cell techniques to look at methylations of single cytosines in a gene that's, in, uh, that's concerned with inactivating the X and showed that they're methylated in the egg and not the sperm. And this was another very important discovery because it's imprinting the differential modification of genes from egg and sperm affecting differential expression in the offspring. Now this was a great taboo <laughs> because that is the basis of Lamarckian inheritance which Darwin believed in, but neo-Darwinian said, no, transmission of characteristics from mum and dad via the genes in egg and sperm into the children is impossible because there's no molecular mechanism. So this here is the first molecular mechanism. So that blew that one and uh, opened up the possibility of Lamarckian inheritance going through generations by the way you live your life, modifying your genes, the modifications going into sperm and egg and into the next, a huge and as, uh, I mean, I, need, I, I only ever do a little thing, uh, popping in and out. I was called a scientific butterfly. I'd ask a question, but I wouldn't sort of capitalise and go on with it. And imprinting is really important. We've known about it for ages. This is a hinny. It's got a donkey mother and a horse father. This is a mule. It's got a horse mother and a donkey father. And they're completely different animals. So imprinting was known that the genes coming through egg and sperm must be operating differently to make these different animals. It wasn't just the size of the womb doing it, because a donkey's got a smaller womb, because they have entirely different phenotypes, big ears and different tails and all sorts of things. So a gene inherited from the father makes best differently from a gene inherited, and that's what we were able to show for the first time to provide this mechanism. So, to finish now, so this need to develop single cell techniques to save mice and uh, the encouragement of my uh, boss Anne McLaren and the accidental serendipitous single cell techniques that seemed to come out of the blue seemed to work for reasons when I made mistakes and things has brought all these insights into development imprinting, mechanism remarking, deprogramming to this, these are the embryo stem cells here. This is the tabula rasa state. And then the difference between the two X's being to do with methylation. And then reprogramming now. And deprogramming, reprogramming uh, is all the nature of um, regenerative medicine, taking embryo stem cells and making them in what you want to make them in order to uh, repair injury or disease. The late origin of the germline and deprogramming meiosis. And then, very briefly, I've already talked about the clinical applications. The single cell techniques went into pioneering experiments in the 80s to enable a couple who's at risk of having a genetically diseased baby that's going to die, suffer and die. And they know they're at risk because they already had one baby with disease, or they know they carry the genes. And they would have to have amniocentesis, which is dangerous then abortion of a much-wanted fetus if it was proved to carry the disease. With IVF, you could just take one cell along the way and diagnose the disease. And then the other thing, from all that I've told you about, human, about embryonic stem cells being deprogrammed, demethylated, undifferentiated, plurin, they grow indefinitely, immortal, invasive, this is what cancer cells are. So immediately I wonder, could deprogramming be the origin of a tumour which later by mutations which make them go faster and faster and faster over the years be the origins of cancer. So I thought, well, if that's the case, if I isolate a lot of genes only expressed in embryo and test for their expression in cancer cells, I'll get new cancer genes, which I did. And this is one, I called it embryo cancer sequence A. This is a lung cancer. This is a normal lung. And here's the gene expressed on the basal membrane where stem cells use. So the stem cells of this cancer um, have uh, uh, turned on my embryonic gene. So lots of insights came from these studies. Late origin, epigenetics, deprogramming, reprogramming, imprinting, pre-implantation, embryo stem cells, regenerative men's embryo cancer genes. 
So coming back, ways of knowing being a scientist, I don't think, it, maybe in operation you look detached, reductionist, materialistic, ma ma mechanistic, and skeptic, but that's very good. But I think what I've tried to show is that serendipity from your mystic informing you, being associated, loving your material, that your poet and mystic come into the science. And anyway, what could be more mystical than born of wonder driven by curiosity, creative explanation of the unknown? That's science. It is mysticism in operation in this materialistic world. And as I said, the more we find out doesn't demystify existence, doesn't spoil it for anybody, it makes the mystery bigger. So coming back to you guys, I, you, I, I mean, it, have you experimented in these realms? Do you find that there's arguments going on between them? Um, uh, just how does it really relate to your life? Obviously, I can only talk about my own life. And in conclusion, I just want to reiterate that I think the whole human is three-dimensional being. The realms of science as part and mystic are separate, opposite, complementary ways. We can experiment, know where we're coming from. They talk to each other, they influence each other. But attempting a synthesis to put them in one box, I, I can't, I would say do not attempt to merge, blend, averaging. They're already reconciled if you can embrace a paradox and understand what complementary opposites are. But what about the conflict? Where is it coming from? See, for me, it's just stupid, you know, not in the same ballpark. But so I'm just wondering, in myself, I know that origins of conflicts are aspects of me in conflict reflected in the external world as within, so without, a house divided against itself. Thanks.